and we're live. <laughs> I love the way he did the countdown in such a way that it wouldn't show up on the uh, video at all. Very nice to see you, Stephen. And same to you. For those of you who don't know us and have never heard of us, this is Seb Schmolder, uh, alt C guru. I, I used to work for Alt. I don't anymore. Alt C X guru. And my name is Stephen Downs, and I'm here to give a talk tomorrow afternoon here at Alt C, which will also be streamed live at 2 p.m. Um, whatever time zone this is, British time. Or is it still British summer time? Yeah. Yeah. So 2 p.m. British summer time, which is uh, 10 a.m. Atlantic daylight time, 9 a.m. Eastern Time and 5 a.m. if we're on the Pacific Coast of North America. It's sad that I know that. <laughs> yep, I would agree with that. So what have you made of the conference so far, Stephen? Uh, it's been fun. Um, I guess my overwhelming impression so far and you know, with all due respect to the conference organizers, very full meeting rooms. Um, so it's, uh, I'm not used to being jam-packed like that. It, it's sort of, because I really, and, and Martin's in the room, so I can say this, I really, really liked the, uh, see again, like video doesn't tell you the whole story, right? Um, I liked, I liked the conference website a lot, and I haven't had a chance to use it at all since I've been here because when you're in these conference rooms, you're like this. And so I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm like this, trying to work. And it's just not conducive to my relaxed online participation. But the talks have been fun. Um, I enjoyed hearing from the uh, student leader, um, and I've forgotten her name, but I have it down here. Um, so you have my, just for the live TV audience, I do have my cheats here. Uh, Rachel Winston from the National Union of Students. Uh, best line of her talk, I, I sort of chuckled to myself because uh, it's one of these things. Um, where did it go? Um, it was something along the lines of, uh, uh, yeah, student union, was very good with communicating with students throughout the process, and I thought, yes, of course you would say that. Um, but it's interesting, because I've had experiences in student leadership myself. Um, I was uh, editor of the student newspaper as an undergrad, and president of the association as a graduate student. And so, it was interesting to see her hackles sort of get up, when the inevitable question came up, are you really representative of students or are you just some active students who have been given a podium? And, you know, with these student association things, it's always a bit of both, right? Because, you know, only the activists really become student representatives. On the other hand, it's untrue to say that they're not representative because there is a process. And as she said, you know, it really depends on the process being a good process, but there is a process. I had the same issues and the way I demonstrated my legitimacy is to organize a massive demonstration, which I understand has happened here as well recently uh, with students. Uh, and I think they're a good thing and I encourage them. And uh, we marched across the bridge and onto the provincial legislature. And I was at the head of that march. And after that, uh, and just so you know, uh, we had 5,000 students march, which is a lot for Canada, not so much for Britain. But it was minus 30 degrees. That's our, plenty then. Yeah. So 5,000 is plenty. Uh, minus 30, and the march was about uh, a mile and a half to two miles. And we had paramedics on standby. And you'd be going so slowly you wouldn't have kept No, going. you go fast. Oh, and when it's minus 30, you go fast. <laughs> so what do you get from Rachel's talk, Stephen? Well, let me check my notes again. Um, yeah. 
because that was mostly what I got from her talk. Um, oh yeah, the, it's interesting. The thing I was thinking about when I listened to the talk, which I needed to remind myself of now, um, is the difference between uh, personalization that is done for you and personalization that you're a part of for yourself. And most, if not all, the personalization that I see uh, being done by learning management systems, course providers, academic institutions, is of the former type. We will personalize it for you. Mm -hmm. And a large part of her talk was about students being engaged not just in the menu selection kind of fashion, but in the actual design of the menu, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the actual nature of the choices that are available, the actual course and, and progressive studies. Uh, you know, it's interesting. People talk about, you know, this is a personalized physics 101 course. And my reaction is, if it's physics 101, it is by definition not personalized. Right? It's, you're going to cover this very specific content area. And personal learning, as opposed to personalized learning, is learning where you pick and choose even what the subject area would be. And I don't know if a university could even manage with that concept, where a student comes and studies for four years, and they choose their own course of studies. Mm -hmm. Although, it was once like that. Yeah. So do you think that that kind of broader broad issue of systems doing the personalizing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously it's a pervasive issue. Oh, what, sure. are you, what are your reflections on it as a pervasive issue across kind of all the different ways in which we use web-based systems nowadays? Well, I mean, it, it's a pervasive issue, not, not even web-based systems, but just systems generally. You know. uh, I was in another session yesterday uh, Jenny McNess and Roy Williams, who were participants in our very first massive open online course and have been done a lot of work on it since. And uh, I'll catch you later. Right. Bye. <laughs> and he walks we right get these in interruptions alive, sometimes, and we that don't was have Bob, the... Bob Harrison, who's uh, someone who just barges in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, but so. Uh, they uh, they had everybody go through an exercise where you take a course and you evaluate it on different dimensions of uh, degrees of emergentism. And emergentism <laughs> and personalization and personal learning are almost synonymous if you use the definitions that they used. They're, they're obviously very different concepts. But in practice, you, you end up with the same terms and the same measures and all of that. So I, I decided, because I'm a contrarian, to evaluate the conference instead of the course. Um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, the, the, the conference has very strict control structures. It has a schedule. Uh, you know, the access is limited. You have to pay money uh, to get to it. You have to travel to it and all of that. Um, so... It's interesting that this this personalization thing impacts not just web-based courses, but pretty much everything. And if actually, I think it's instructive to look outside online courses to think about the different degrees we can have personal as opposed to personalized learning. Um, you know, you, you think about the design of a city, even uh, where you know people create their own personal dwellings or personal residences. They choose where they're going to live uh, to a certain degree, how much they're going to spend, depending on their means, etc. So, but, you know, <coughs> it, you know, I'm, I was, one of the things I'm thinking about, you know, because I've spent, I spend the whole time at this conference thinking about what am I going to say tomorrow, because I have a deadline. <laughs> Uh, and I really need to write my talk sometime before I give it. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about is the explanation of why MOOCs fail. And uh, of course they don't really fail, but, but that's a different issue. 
but the explanation, if I had to give an explanation, my explanation would be, well, it's because they're courses. That 90%, maybe more, of MOOCs basically are some course that's the equivalent of a university course or some similar facsimile uh, that's been put online and quote-unquote open. And so all the things that don't really work in terms of personal learning with courses are things that don't really learn, that don't really work in terms of personal learning with MOOCs. Yes, I mean I might take issue a bit with one aspect of that mm -hmm. and I'm reflecting on having done to conclusion kind of properly two MOOCs mm -hmm. and the thing that I found completely counterintuitive was that in both of them I felt I was in a one-to-one -one dialogue with the teachers whose stuff had been canned months previously and I'd got kind of two halves of my brain mm -hmm. operating at once, one saying this has all been canned previously, it's utterly impersonal, sure. and the other half saying this feels like I'm in a one-to-one -one dialogue, mm -hmm. and the fact that it felt like I was in a one-to-one -one dialogue uh, definitely altered my motivation and helped me learn, made me determined to succeed. Sure. And that just struck me as a very, very odd characteristic, which to some extent I think has been ignored when people describe uh, content-rich, uh, non-collaborative MOOCs as simply a, another form of publishing. Because although sort of technically they're another form of publishing, from the point of view of what learners yeah. feel like, that, that doesn't feel like reading a book in the I was slightest. just going to ask, what's the difference between the MOOC you just took and reading a really good book? Because like, I read Gibbons, Decline and Fall, and at the end of it I thought I'd lost a friend. Yes, I mean that may be because uh, you, unlike I, don't relate to books in that way, uh, and it may be that the proportion of people who kind of feel personally engaged by content is kind of very small mm -hmm. in either context, in yeah. which case it's an, it's an outlier effect and therefore we don't have to worry about Could it. Look, yeah. But I, I certainly got the sense from fellow students with whom I discussed this that mm -hmm. that was a very <coughs> predominant mm -hmm. feeling that they felt, I mean there's a guy on the AI course that Peter Norvig and Sebastian Thrum did who mm -hmm. said it felt like sitting in a bar with a really smart friend sure. who was explaining things to you in a way which you knew you were going to get your head around. <coughs> mm -hmm. That strikes me as, as a remarkable um, set of feelings yeah. to have engendered in learners but that's through, exactly, de through dead content. That's not really what we think of as a course, though. Sitting in a bar talking with somebody who's really smart. I mean, that's, okay. that's almost not transferring the, the academic process, right? It's, it's something different. And it's interesting as well, you, you, you say, you know, you were talking to people in the course, which means you were talking to people in the course. So the course did not consist only of those videos. But uh, Although, to be um, clear, mm -hmm. um, most of those conversations happened... After. when the colic course was well near completion. Yeah. So if I think about the two individuals that I kind of struck up extensive dialogue with, mm -hmm. it was essentially because I was writing about the course that they picked up on it and we sure. got to know each other. We didn't get to know each other through the course yeah. uh, processes. How important was the writing up? For me? To your participation in the course? Um, it clearly meant that I was thinking about the course mm -hmm. in a way I wouldn't have been thinking about it if, this is a self-evident point I'm making, that yeah. knowing that each week I was <laughs> going to have to write a report yeah. um, meant I approached it in a different kind of way. Yeah. And, it, and of course, to remove us, ourselves from the realm of self-evidence, different how? Uh, different how. I was observing the sort of pedagogic processes mm. because I was writing about them. Yeah. So it's almost like the instructors were the instructor was a colleague. Um, no. No. <laughs> that, 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 not specially. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so clearly 
but people who are themselves kind of interested in aficionados of online learning, their take on experiencing online learning is going to be different from yeah. people who are not aficionados. Right, I think, and we, we want to be careful here too, because the term, terminology can be confusing. Because we're talking about personalization or personal in terms of the personal connection that you get with the instructor or the material. But when I talk about personal learning or personalized learning, I'm talking about the degree to which the learner is in control or, or is defining the course and the environment. There's, they're two very different things, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And I think both are desirable. I mean, what you're describing is what Terry Anderson describes as presence. And, and this, you know, this, this presence, whether it's an actual physical presence like we have here, even although the camera is a third presence in our conversation, I'm certainly aware of it, and I'm sure you are. Mm -hmm. Um, because I'm just like, the <laughs> um, you know, but the, the presence is a desirable feature in a course and in learning materials that doesn't require that the person actually be present in order to generate presence. That's one of his theses. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that would stimulate engagement. But, you know, I mean, I think if a person is designing their own course, their, their own learning experience, they may or may not seek that out. Uh, they may or may not seek out the presence of particular individuals or particular types of individuals. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think there are two major TV series that were influential on me. Um, and, and create, oh, actually three. I'll, I'll use three because it's better. Um, where this sort of presence was created. One was Kenneth Clark's Civilization, another was Carl Sagan's Cosmos, and another was Patrick Watson's The Struggle for Democracy. You may have heard of one, two, or all three, probably not all three. Two. Two, okay, yeah. And I much preferred Carl Sagan and Patrick Watson for different ways than Kenneth Clark. Kenneth Clark, I'm sure he's brilliant, affable, and all of that, not a guy I'd have a beer with, just, you know, uh, just, just, you know. He might, you might not have been the kind of guy he'd have had a beer with. <laughs> yeah, I, I exactly. Suspect. And, and, you know, as much as Kenneth Clark tried to personalize that course, for me, um, it wouldn't have worked, right? It has to be me picking I'm going to study art, I'm going to do it a different way. Although I will say I love the book. So I'd just like to, we're, we're, we're being asked to wrap up, so we're going to wrap up. You'd just like to wrap up now. I'd just like to wrap up now. I hadn't expected the conversation to take this form, and yeah. uh, it's been interesting having it. And we need to remember to tell oh, yes. uh, people who are watching this that something is happening later. There's more of this, and <laughs> more there are also some uh, live streaming of various keynotes, including Stevens and Dame Wendy Hall's this afternoon, and I think uh, before Wendy Hall's keynote, there's a live streaming of a presentation by two people who are here from the Sloan Consortium. Uh, I think those are the three things that are happening that are live streamed. Uh, oh, we'll, very good. Um, we'll, no, you, we'll, we'll cut, you we'll cut you an end at this notes. point. Well, Thank except you. except to say, don't cut it off yet, that you heard it here first. Seb Schmoller has declared that the world is not ending right now. Something else will be happening. Thank you.